to come into Kenya. But this is your first time in Kenya. His alma mater is the University of Colon, which I intend to visit in the next few months. He further held management positions at the Boston Consulting Group and Robert Foshier. And Arthur did little in China. He served with the German Armed Forces, so he's a general, I believe, in the Inscripted Communication and Military Intelligence in the Unit Operating Rockets for Conventional and Nuclear Warheads during the Cold War. Marcus enjoys photography, arts, and literature, and at his first solo exhibition in 46 Fengjia, Hutong, Beijing, in 2014. Marcus, without further ado, welcome. <laughs> discuss what that what we can learn from it and basically I think everybody can can see perhaps this from a little bit of a different perspective. So it's it's not I'm not the guy coming after two weeks in Kenya and telling you what to do in Kenya because I don't know. Um, but uh, what I want to do is I want to introduce you to, to a different development model which is here the Chinese and uh, and then you can see what they did and how they did it with which kind of logic if any and uh, and then see what uh, what you can derive from that and then we can discuss that of course. Um, so a little bit of an introduction why why I can talk about China. You might think my wife can talk about China because she's Chinese obviously I, I, I'm not <laughs> uh, but I stayed I spent I lived five, 12 years in 12 years in China and uh, at the end of at the end of my my time there uh, this was my view from my office. So I was, we didn't have a very high building. Um, we were trying to keep a low profile Volkswagen. And uh, this was view from my office. And this is the flag of Volkswagen Group China. So you know the, you know the, the Volkswagen brand, VW, you have seen. And then Eric, before he also mentioned, there are quite a few other brands in the Volkswagen Group, which is the holding company, uh, which also belong, belong to them, which is Volkswagen, Audi, um, yeah. Volkswagen, Audi, Skoda, Porsche, Bugatti, Lamborghini, MAN, Scania, Seat, Ducati, Bentley. Mm -hmm. I forgot what. Volkswagen Utilities. Yeah. Volkswagen Utilities. So all these, all these uh, cars, all these car brands are all managed through the Volkswagen, through the Volkswagen Group. And Volkswagen Group China is the holding company which holds um, the joint ventures and some, some, other, some other operations from there. We have about 50,000 employees in uh, China and we have in these joint ventures and we have, uh, have 600,000 600, employees Volkswagen Group worldwide. We, we wanted to become the largest car manufacturer in the world um, this year, no last year, but something went wrong, you might have read it. <laughs> still, working, still working on that. Yeah? Still, Still working, working on this. The interesting thing is when I came to China in 2003, um, I was basically sent there uh, from a department which is, was dealing with, uh, it was called ROW, Rest of World. So they said you go to something which is Rest of World, which was China. It was a very, very small operation. It was just under, under half a million cars altogether. Today, China altogether makes 40% of the entire sales of the Volkswagen Group. So it's 4 million units which we produce, 4 million units which we produce and import um, um, to China and sell them there. So you could say this is the most important single market for the Volkswagen Group. And from being at the rest of the world, suddenly we figured out we are basically in the center of the whole thing. The Volkswagen Group, or the Volkswagen in China, uh, goes into distress. Volkswagen worldwide is bankrupt. So that's that's the that's how, how the situation changed. 
I'll show you a few other things. Have you ever been to China? Has somebody has been for a visit or something? That's how, that's actually not really true. That's not the view on my dinner table. That's the view on my dinner table and a very special, very special, uh, very special dinner. This was what my father-in-law was cooking when my parents were visiting their home in Dumutai, China. So you, you, you can see all the different dishes. And so this is it's a bit too, too bright here. These are, these are, I think, a thousand year eggs or something. Don't worry, they're not a thousand years old, but they look like it. And uh, all kinds of all kinds of other dishes. So it's um, that's uh, that's a view of the dinner table. I want to give you a brief introduction, which I think is is, is useful to understand the overall context of uh, what we have been doing in China. And then you later I will I will spread out uh, further to explain what this means also for other industries. I give you a brief introduction to one of our joint ventures. We have two joint ventures. One is 50-50% equity shareholding, which is called Shanghai Volkswagen. And that's this one. And there's another one, which is 60-40 equity shareholding, with another company where we have a minority share, with another company called FAW. Sometimes you will see trucks here, which have the FAW, um, FAW logo. That's our, that's our joint venture partner. That's not us. They also make trucks under their own, under their own, uh, under their own brand. First automotive works. Um, so this here is it's very unclear, unfortunately, but this is a picture of the entrance to uh, a city called Anting. And Anting is very, very close to Shanghai. It's between one hour and one day drive, depending on the traffic. Um, <laughs> And then you, then you come into Anting, and you, you, might not, you might not see it from the back, but this one here is the entry gate, and it says, bring prosperity to Anting Automobile City. So everybody who is going in here is reminded, especially every foreigner is reminded, what you are here for. Yeah? So you're not here for making money as an international company and take it back to your headquarter. No, you are make, you're making money to build Anting Automobile City and basically to help and develop one of the pillar industries of China. And this is also one of the things I will talk about later. China in this is very, very successful. You don't just go in, make money and leave. You, you, you go in to transfer something, which is normally knowledge, uh, technology, technology transfer and other things. This here on the right side is our car plan 3. This is a Santana car. I just see this is one of the cars which we entered with, one of the first ones I'll show you later. The Santana is very, it's like a Toyota Probox. That's the equivalent. Yeah? A very simple, very simple car. I'll show you later how we, how we did it. And what you find in Hunting Automobile City is a lot of things which have to do with automobile production, R&D, uh, education, there's a university campus of Pongji University there. All these things have been built up in, in Anting. Anting wants to, uh, sometimes says, we want to become uh, the Detroit of China. And this tells me that they have never been to Detroit because actually nobody wants to become Detroit. <laughs> I hope. But that's, that's, um, that's, how they, that's how they see themselves. And this is why this is a city which is built around automotive. Even the city center of Anting is a copy of a German city called Weimar. So they went to Weimar, had a look how it looks like, and then they copied this thing one to one um, into, into Anting because it should have something like a German touch. And it's interesting, it really, really looks a bit like, like uh, they copied the whole German city. Um, and it's, it's funny for me to go there, there's a beer garden, um, all kinds of things which, which, they think is, which they think is German. Just in the, in the real city of Weimar, there's a Goethe and Schiller, which are two very famous German authors, uh, classical literature authors. They are standing, there's two statues in the middle, and in hunting they skip that, they put somebody else in there. So they didn't, they didn't take our, our German authors. Yeah. Um, so, a bit about the history. We came in, we founded this, this company in 1984. It was the former CEO of Volkswagen at the time, Dr. Karl Hahn, who founded this, and he decided to go with a joint venture partner, which is called SIDE, Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation, um, because he wanted to set up something like a deal. You give me access to the market, I bring you the technology. 
Because at the time, you couldn't sell cars because cars were allocated to government officials. That's a communist country. You cannot, could not go to a shop and buy a car. What happened was you gave, you gave the car, you allocated the car to a government official. So to have access to the market, you needed a kind of partner which has access to, this, to these government institutions. Otherwise, there would be no way. So it's a 50-50 joint venture. Over time, it became a symbol of the most successful Chinese-German joint venture ever. And uh, when we had 20th anniversary in 2004, some people even said, um, well, this was not just the beginning of, uh, of automotive industry in China, it was, it was also the beginning of modern industrialization in China. And this time, English letter here, who was the head of production at the time, he even said, even if you buy a Honda today, you only have the money to buy the Honda because we were here in 1984. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very proud setting. Um, people are very, they feel they're very, very strong, unsinkable. We came in in 1984 with a car called Santana, I showed you before, that's the Pro Box type of thing. Um, it doesn't look like a Pro Box, but it's very rugged, easy to repair, and it was a CKT set, which was basically assembled in China. Only, and the interesting thing about this car was, we introduced it in 1984, but it was discontinued in Europe in 1976, and it was called Passat. Yeah, so this is an old car going into China. So if you steal the intellectual property of this car, or you copy the intellectual property of this car, actually nobody cares because nobody's going to build this anymore in Europe anyway, because it's not, it's not competitive. So it's a car discontinued in 1976, most of you know being born, which went into China in 1984. So this was, um, this was, of course he didn't say this, Karl Hahn didn't say this to the Chinese officials, he said, I bring you a car which fits the Chinese requirements. He didn't say, I bring you a car which is so old that we don't need it anymore. Yeah. Um, but it's fine, and it's still running. There was a, a combi version of this one, um, and there was a, there's a, there's a, a facelift of this one, Santana 2000, then there was a Santana 3000, then there's a Santana Vista, then there's a thing Santana Vista Plus, and there must be many, many others. They are all the same. Just look a little bit different. They're all based, based on this platform up to here. And we had introduced the Passat, made it a little bit longer, because at the time, people in China, when they had a car, when you had money for a car, or you had the status for a car, you also had a driver. So you were not sitting and driving the car, you were sitting in the back, because you were very important. So we figured out oh, we'll make this car a little bit longer, so that people sitting in the back feel more comfortable. Um, so this is why this was also became very very successful vehicle. But when I came there in 2003, this was also kind of getting on. Then we had our chairman of the board, Dr. Weisgerber. He always was he was head of production in uh, in Wolfsburg, and he always flew to Shanghai Volkswagen. He flew in with a company jet, then he was picked up. Then he looked out of the window of his car, and then he said, "Chinese are small. We need a small car." <laughs> It was the kind of research he was doing. Yeah? He was famous for that. Um, so he said, then we said, okay, we, what kind of small car do we have? So we looked into into the into the models we have, and one of them one of them is the Polo. So we introduced the Polo into China, and it did not work at all. It was a complete disaster. One reason was big cars are expensive at that time, and small cars are cheap. And we came with a small car which was expensive. So this was just completely not fitting to the market. The only thing it was it was small and also the design was not appealing. Then we thought it has something to do with the shape, because people were used to the three box, three box design. This one. And we came with a car which looked like this, or the notchback or the hatchback. So we thought perhaps it's the shape. So we made it on a notchback photo, had the same problems, same disaster. Then we said we need a cheap car. We understood a cheap small car. And we need it very quick. Now to develop and produce a car in any place takes about three years. So we said we need it quicker. And the trick we made was we took a car from Brazil which is called Gold. Gold. Not Gold. Gold. Yeah. From Brazil. We took this, took this gold from Brazil and brought it into China. It's also an old car. And 80% of the parts between this and this are the same. 
So 80% of the parts we already had local, only the body we imported from Brazil. So after six months we had a new small car, very cheap, but the problem was that um, people knew that and we started it with a, with a two-door version and no air condition in Shanghai in summer and that was the end of it. <laughs> then, we, then, we tried a, then we tried a gold sports edition. Always when you see a limited edition, that means it's the end of it. Uh, because we still tried to boost it a little bit, but then we yeah, finished. Yeah. So this one we didn't have at the time. And now when you look at the situation here, it's actually getting very, very tricky. Because you have old up to here, disaster, 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 mega disaster coming. There's still something coming which, which is worse, which is the Volkswagen Touran, which is a very, very good car, a 5 to 7 seater, a family car. But what we did was we introduced the family car into a country with one child policy. And that was <laughs> So that's the kind of research you do when you just look out of the window <laughs> picked up from the, from the airport. Yeah. But we fixed all that from 2003 to 2007. I think we fixed a lot of things, but we had to lay off 5,000 people. We lost a lot of cars. We had a huge overstocking in the factory, and it was, it was actually quite, quite hard. Now let's come to the agenda of what I want to talk about today, because this was just the introduction showing you that I'm qualified to talk about China and its <laughs> So the agenda I want to talk about today is first, the economic development model of China since the beginning of the opening and reform policy. China has a long history, as you know, it goes back to 5,000 years ago, something like this, they invented paper and the compass and all kinds of things. Um, that I'm not going to talk about that. Then there was a time from 1949 um, until the death of Mao Zedong. Let's also not talk about that because the Chinese also don't talk about that. And then we start in 1979 with the opening and reform policy of China because at the point 19, 1979, at the point of 1979, China was a very, very poor country, absolutely at the, at the ground. And uh, so we talk, start to talk about from this opening point onward um, because this is also the only thing relevant for us. Then I want to introduce a vision of China for, uh, for 2030, which has been worked out uh, in, um, by my Chinese social scientists and uh, together with the World Bank. Um, I want to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the current Chinese um, economy. And I want to show you a few mega trends in China, um, some of them positive, some of them negative, so you can make up your mind what other things you can learn about. Let's start with the first chapter. Economic development of China since the beginning of the opening and reform policy. And uh, this is strongly linked with one person, which is Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping had his ups and downs, I understand, politically during the time before, but after, um, after, the, after the death of Mao Zedong, he became, he became the leader of China. And uh, he very, very early on, he started to change the system in a way that it is that it is more open because also the country was it, was, it can't go backdrop it was it was completely closed it was basically like North Korea yeah, but much bigger than North Korea. So the first thing or one of the first things he did was he started to experiment with other models than with communism. So he said, why don't I go to Shenzhen where he comes from? And we make Shenzhen a special economic zone. And in this special economic zone, we can have things like, like uh, private companies, uh, we can have free trade zones, we can have all these things. And this was for, for a communist society, this was very scary, suddenly, suddenly uh, experimenting with these things. The second thing was Shenzhen is just the neighbor city of Hong Kong. And Hong Kong at that time was still under British, under British rule. So the idea was, because Deng Xiaoping already had the vision to take uh, Hong Kong back into China, the vision was when, when these two cities unite one day, if we take away the border one day, there shouldn't be too much difference between the wealth. Because if you take away the border, and Hong Kong is rich and Shenzhen is poor, everybody will run to Hong Kong, and then Hong Kong collapses. So he, he had the vision of having not this migration pressure on there, so to develop something in an experimental zone which is similar to Hong Kong, 
so he can perhaps one day, or not him, he himself, because there's a contract which guarantees the rights of Hong Kong for another 40 years, um, but later he can, he can remove the, somebody can remove the border. So taking back of Hong Kong um, as a special administrative zone was also one of these experiments. And also in Hong Kong there's a different currency, there's not the RMB, because the RMB is not floated, the RMB is linked against a secret basket, and some people even doubt there is any basket. Uh, so secret, <laughs> so there might be no basket. But Hong Kong has a Hong Kong dollar which is linked to the US dollar. Hong Kong has a functioning stock market and all these kinds of things. So it's a perfect experimental field, ex ex experimental field for communist China to have something like a region like this. And it wouldn't have any kind of impact. Today sometimes you see this in the news, you see these kinds of demonstrations that the Hong Kong people want to have democracy and uh, the Chinese, mainland Chinese say we do this a little bit slower and uh, the interesting thing is actually when the Chinese took Hong Kong back um, the experiment was not with democracy, the experiment was with capitalism so they wanted to find out what capitalism is like, not what democracy is like, that's, that's a far way to go <laughs> um, allowing then foreign currency investment or foreign investment into industries under certain conditions that was also one of the things he started and at the beginning there was no repatriation of money so when we went into China and we made money we were not allowed to take the money out of the country it had to stay in China we were sitting on 5 billion euro in 2003 uh, which, were, which was in, inside, inside China which we couldn't take back and for China this is a good thing because it's not the company coming in making money and taking it out it's not possible to take it out we had our tricks, believe me but it's not possible now tricks is like playing around with X works prices for material and things which have to be paid, but that's, that's where you need the lawyers. <laughs> um, then industrial and economic reform policies and privatization of state-owned assets. So the state-owned companies, everything was state-owned, now had to be had to be privatized. So this was a stage, this was a stage um, also where this started. And then later laying the foundation for China to enter the WTO. Um, in 2002, and that was, I think, yeah, the, one of the major steps here. So I came to China in 2003 after all that happened, and I came to China because after WTO was joined, a lot of competition came into China. All the car manufacturers came into China. And our paradise that we were alone and having 60% market share was just gone. Uh, suddenly we had to compete in, in, a, in a more or less open market. This was my personal reason why, why I went why I went. I was actually not prepared to go to China in 2003. What happened was I went to the men's room in the, in the German headquarter and the guy beside me, he said, uh, go wash your hands, come to my office and go to China. That was basically <laughs> I washed it very carefully because I wasn't sure when I can do that again. And then, then I even complained that, that they, I said, why do you send me to China because I don't speak Chinese. And he was this wise guy, and he, he said, everybody I sent to China speaks three languages, which is German, not German, and very not German. So, I actually didn't qualify because I don't speak very well German, but, but we have people who can do that. Yeah, they, they don't. <laughs> Good. At the beginning, what were the success factors of what Deng Xiaoping was doing? Yeah. Um, first of all, China was, was focusing on the labor-intensive industries. It was manufacturing mainly. They wanted to have the vision to convert China into the factory of the world. Because this can employ a lot of people. Yeah. If we have, we have 50,000 people now, now in China working, working for us, these, these industries employ a lot of people. So they said, we, want, we don't want to do the, the Indian thing. A lot of people sitting in a village programming something which nobody needs. Um, that's the Indian model. It's more like we, want to, we don't want to produce things. And to be competitive with that, to actually become the factory of the world, which they are now, no doubt, they undervalued quite a few things. One thing was resources. A lot of steel and coal and things which are local and which are actually which don't have this, the right the right price from the world market but they don't need that yeah? so they can put cheap resources into the system 
Second thing is cheap labor, undervaluing labor, underpaying basically. Third thing is environmental cost of the whole thing. So it's of course if you if you undervalue this, what happens is it works for a while, but then you tend to waste it. If resources are too cheap, you waste the resources. If labor is too cheap, you exploit your workers. If environment is too cheap, you have a lot of pollution. So, but at the beginning, it helped a lot to take off. But we we'll later see what happen what's happening now. Then focus on economic, on economic growth by setting GDP targets. So it was not just the GDP measures the success of the system. It was different. It was the GDP target was set, and then all the functionaries of the municipal governments and of the state-owned companies they had to make their contribution to this target, and they only looked at GDP and social stability. These are the only two things, but mainly GDP because they believe at the time GDP. As long as the country grows fast, then you look into the future. If the country doesn't grow fast anymore, you look at your neighbor. And that's very dangerous because it's not really, not really a, a kind of, there's not really a middle class developing too much. And the middle class we have is very much under pressure. So fast growth is everything. Foreign direct investment to support the GDP and technology transfer to China. Joint venture regulations, the fact that we had to go into joint ventures, you can't produce cars or planes or pharmaceuticals or telecom services or equipment or anything without going into a joint venture. You need to have a Chinese partner to either transfer technology or in some cases they do it just to make sure that, for example, telecommunication also reaches the furthest part of China. If you give telecommunication infrastructure to market forces, Tibet will never have a telephone. So what they did was they said they keep this under the control of state-owned companies and push the infrastructure development into these corners. What agreements? It's called build, operate, transfer. We take a British company, Thames Water, into China. They build together a sanitation plant. They run it together for a few years. And after the Chinese party has learned how to operate it, you transfer it, you transfer it to the Chinese partner. It's part of the deal. Building up technical development, uh, uh, technical and R&D capabilities in domestic companies, very, very important. So the Chinese said, there comes the time, we cannot just be the factory, we also have to develop our own products. For example, the mobile phone I have, which is far better than any iPhone, and far cheaper. <laughs> So these kinds of things they have been Chinese developed. Yeah. And then reform and restructuring of state-owned enterprises. This was also one of the steps taken. State-owned enterprises, I don't go too much into the details just because we want to have time to chat a little bit in the end. They on many on many aspects, here for example, pre-tax return on equity from 1996 to, now this ends, I think, 2013, um, the state-owned enterprises are underperforming. Also what you see here is, that's called leverage, is asset to equity in the company. So when you see how much assets they have towards the equity they have, the state-owned companies here, the blue line, are underperforming, underperforming also. This is normally an indication for overcapacity. You, you have too much capacity in your, in your, um, in your company. There are different ways of starting to, starting to change this and starting to reform these state-owned enterprises. One is the ownership through diversification. You don't just have state-owned owners, but you encourage private investment also in this. And the other one would be, you need a modern enterprise government. China is not on a low level, but on a high level, until recently, a very corrupt country. Um, so you have to be you have to be careful that you that you change these governance structures in, inside these state-owned companies in a way that they can be competitive in the future. And under the current president of China, the corruption has been decreased dramatically because this was one of his huge initiatives um, to, to reduce corruption. And today, if somebody wants to take you for dinner, um, you better think twice if it's an expensive dinner. So it's it's really it is really has been has been. Uh, has been tackled a lot. Some people criticize Xi Jinping, the current president, saying you don't just do this to prevent corruption, you also use this to eliminate political enemies. So what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the country
countries moving forward. And uh, yeah, there's, a, there's an initiative to bring state-owned uh, state enterprises under, under a unified, under a unified uh, asset management system and asset management bureau. And this one here just shows on me all of it, how fast this goes. Huh? 12th of November 2013, I start to think about it. And on the 15th of July 2014, six um, target companies have been identified who are going to do these things. It's the same thing like Shenzhen. Let's try it with six big companies and see what we learn. And then we try it with 20 and then we try it with the rest. And then before you go for all of them, you have been doing quite a few, quite a few steps and rounds of learning. And it goes very, very fast. Six, seven months decision span. China was competing a very long time on being cheap. And I have a list here which we had from our forensic auditing in, uh, in Shanghai. Not in Shanghai, folks, sorry, we didn't have a forensic auditing, but we had forensic auditors coming in and seeing actually why, why are these companies so cheap. And this is a list of reasons why. And this list of reasons was in 2003, 2004, it was still in place, but Actually, this competitive advantage of being cheap is all faded. Because here on the right side, on the right column, you see all the reasons why this is not working anymore in the future. So this is also why China is now moving up within the value chain very, very much, because they can't, can't um, keep um, the cost advantage. One was cheap labor, but you have a high salary inflation and even labor shortages. You might think 1.3 billion people, there are enough people to work, you have labor shortages, people don't come back into the cities to work after Chinese New Year, they stay at home in the countryside because they can also make money there. And a lot of cheap manufacturing moves from China to places like Vietnam, for example, the textile industry. Minimal cost of social security, there's a new labor law, um, which was introduced in 2007, so it's not too new anymore. But also here, the cost of social security is rising, actually social security is starting to get in place. Alternative cash flows allow price funding in tenders. The typical Chinese businessman has not just one main part, he has a lot. He has a shopping mall, a cinema, a hotel, a cement factory, uh, um, whatever, a, a car, a plastic molding factory, all these kinds of things. So when they go into a tender, they can actually allow very, very cheap prices by taking, taking, uh, taking money from another company. But that's of course something in the long run, this will kill you. Low accounting and management uh, competence. So sometimes they don't even know that they will go bankrupt if they continue like that. Yeah? So that that's, might happen in some, in some cases, but it's also, of course, uh, now getting less and less. Cheaper material use. But you have increased quality requirements, so you can't use cheaper material in the future anymore, even now not anymore. Overcapacities, we always had this in Shanghai, when government officials came to our visit us, they always wanted to see that we are the biggest in the world, and we always said oh, we are the biggest, or the biggest in China. And they always said, this is our factory, it's the biggest in China. So everywhere they went, they required that you are the biggest in China. So if everybody is the biggest in China, it's too big. Yeah. <laughs> it's far too big, so you get a lot of overcapacity over here. Um, you have undervalued purchase of state assets. Um, so you have state assets and they are bought, and then sometimes there's corruption in place, so you get them much, much cheaper by giving somebody a brown envelope or whatever, um, or a scholarship or whatever for the children, things like that. But that's also not SASAC, and there's a corruption plan down, it's not, not working anymore. SASAC is a, is a control agency for the state owned assets. Cross selling of overcapacities, something they do. VAT offset. Um, of material, but not of investment. This was also an interesting one. So if you, if you want, VAT is clear, value added tax. If you, want, uh, if you want to reclaim the VAT, you can only do this on expenses, you can't do this on an investment. So if you want to buy a machine, this would be an investment. So to make this an expense, what do you do? You buy the machine in parts. You don't buy the machine, you buy the parts of the machine. Of course the machine doesn't come in parts, but the invoice comes in parts. So 
So on the balance sheet of a company like this, you have very high cost and very low investment. And that's the interesting thing is then that the machine does not exist. If the machine doesn't exist, then the production doesn't exist, and the sales doesn't exist, and the tax doesn't exist. So you can build up a whole black economy beside unknown economy beside the fence of your factory. And that's what has been has been done here. With the, with the VAT offset for material, but not for investments. Cheap loans, but the law has changed and there is stricter enforcement. Cheap loans from state owned banks, no proper risk reserves, copying of technology, low environmental cost, and non floated currency. So these are also some other factors which make it cheap, but all of these things won't work in the future. So that's kind of the view. What happened from, two, from 1979 until something like now? Well, let's see what is the vision of China from now on into the future. I'll give you an estimate about how this should look. There was a China 2030, a joint research of the World Bank and the Development Research Center of the State Council in 2012. And these two institutions together Define it's a big, big book you can download from the internet from the World Bank website. It's a big, big book defined in very much in detail for every different little industry uh, in China what should be achieved in 2030. And I try to squeeze this now, like just show you the vision into one PowerPoint slide. They want to be modern, harmonious, have a high income, and they want to be creative. So, what does modern mean? Modern means industrialized and urbanized, enjoy quality of life on par with the Western world, so I have the same quality of life like the Western world, like in Europe, um, modern values, modern economics, and modern social structure, whatever modern means in this, in this context. And the, the, the path is towards this until 2030. What does high income mean? High income means as a, as a rule of thumb, the same annual per capita income as South Korea, which is about 16,000 US dollars. So that, that should be the capita income in China by 2030, and then they would have the same per capita income as South Korea. Harmonious. Harmonious is very important if you live in a country which is very much ruled from the top. Because if it's not harmonious, then you have all kinds of revolts and things which you don't want. So one of the one of the uh, one of the targets here is to build a strong middle class which keeps the society together and peaceful and because there are many ethnic minorities also, so that's the kind of harmony. Always when I see this word harmony, we wouldn't find the word harmony in a let's say joint declaration of a of a government, but we find it in China. And the, uh, the last one here is they want to be creative. And creative means in 2030, the time is over where you just copy things from others and build them cheaper. Um, you, have to, you have to build up your own, your own things. This is a picture where you have the real GDP per capita in US, 1000 US dollars. And here the growth rate on this side and the size of the bubble is the absolute GDP. And you see here, this is the plan how China wants to move until 2030. This is where China is now, 2020 here, and 2030 was. Overall, the GDP growth is slowing down. So it's not going to be... GDP growth is not going to stay at above seven percent here. It's going to go down, but that's also normal because when the cake is bigger, you you can't grow so fast anymore. You have to slow it. Flip over a few. I think this was already an introduction. What I want to look up and um, take the current strengths and weaknesses of the Chinese economy. It was, it was a setting I've, I've seen in a shopping mall in China. I found that quite funny. So that's, a, that's an artist who shows how he sees the Chinese economy. So it's a, it's a bull, this is a man, and the bull is making a big fart, 
pushing the man against the wall, but what is going to happen next? The guy is going to drop it off. So many people say what you see in China at the moment <coughs> is actually not a sustainable development. So what are the strengths and weaknesses? One of the strengths is there's a large domestic market. China has a very, very large domestic market, so it wouldn't even be possible to sustain this for quite a while without, um, without exporting too much. Second strength is there's potential government protection. So the government is able to protect, um, protect, the, the, protect this market from imports coming from outside. <coughs> Then there would be. Uh, the third point is curbing corruption on a large scale, uh, international leverage, and a non floated currency. So these are, these are the strengths which you see on the left side. And on the other side, you see quite a few weaknesses. <coughs> One is risk of overcapacity, uh, municipal and corporate and corporate debt are getting very, very high, so it's actually getting to the same level of what you have sometimes in Western countries. Low technical capabilities, potential housing, housing problem, and uh, slow improvement and work and living conditions for the middle class, and a lot of brain drain. A lot of people actually are leaving China, which they need to fulfill <coughs> their requirements for the future. So I have to sit down and review a few times. As a last part, I want to show you what is happening at the moment in China with, uh, in terms of the major trends which we have. One is, so these are the mega trends which we have been using for our research in, uh, in Volkswagen Group China, which we think is going to happen with the Chinese economy in the future, and what are the things driving it. One is, you have a maturing economy, um, which means basically the growth of the Chinese economy is not going to stay at the same speed as it is at the moment. As I, as I showed you, it's going to go down to something like 4.5%. Second thing is, there's a demographic change. Because of, for example, the one-child policy, you will have a lot of older people but you don't have a lot of children coming into the society. So in the future, you might run out of workers. Next trend is urbanization. About more, nearly a billion people in China at the moment are living in are living in cities. They are not living in the countryside anymore, and this is one of the major drivers <coughs> of the Chinese economy. The fourth one is there's a lot of pollution. There's water pollution. There's air pollution. I'll show you a few pictures later. That's something also which is becoming a constraint. Fifth one is. The efficiency of the Chinese economy is very, very low. And mainly the, the waste of energy in China is so high that this has become a major target to reduce the energy efficiency or to increase the energy efficiency for the output of the Chinese economy. And the sixth one is China has a lot of territorial conflicts. So you have, when you look at the borders of China, um, they're not always friends. There are conflicts with India, there are conflicts with Taiwan, there are conflicts with Japan. Um, and, and others on the, on, the, on the western side, so this is not, not easy to control. So this, here, all of these trends of course have been identified and they are tackled. Um, so China tries to, to deal with the maturing economy and say, actually we want to build our economy in a way that it becomes more profitable and less, um, less, less focused on growth, then we have um, here we have a loosening of the one-child policy. At, actually, at the moment, you can get two children. You can apply for a second child. Um, and, so just to just to make sure it also doesn't go too fast, and get new mobility solutions and get smarter smarter cities, which uh, use less use less traffic, pushing of new like, new energy vehicles here, and other things to help uh, reducing the pollution and the increase of the resource efficiency of the, uh, the Chinese economy. So just more examples. I just want to show you a few pictures. This is close to our home. 
where we lived on a bad day. So this is this is a road, a major road. This is a second second ring, I think, second ring road around Beijing. And when you look from the bridge, it looks like this. And you would say that this is not a good day. But if you go to a website where you can find whether this is a good day or not, you will find the following information. City average, it's good. And then you find a little, a little claim here. Yeah? It says data from this source was censored on the orders of the government. <laughs> so when you look at your website, you will find oh, that's nice. He has overworked me, that's it. <laughs> Just sit down. When you look on the website, you will see it's uh, it's actually it's, it should actually be good. So for the records, it's good. But when you when you look at out of the window, you will find it's really really bad. Next one: urbanization rate. China is going to seize urbanization as one of the one of the driving forces for the Chinese economy. So the urbanization rate here is actually quite high and will even increase more. So there's there's no way to turn this back. And you have to have cities which are very, very well managed. If Nairobi continues this way, it will be finished in three years time. It will be unlivable. It will be undrivable anymore. So also here, for example, this is one of the things. If you would go this Chinese way, you have to be really, really careful that you find a, find a way to manage the cities. As a last page, because I think this is very important, this is the energy intensity of the GDP growth. Energy intensity is how much energy do I actually have to consume to produce a unit of GDP. And this here is in, in uh, tons of oil equivalents per million US dollars GDP. And you see where it comes from. It's basically a waste of energy. And you see here that's the government target. For 2050 is about this level of about 400. So that's quite important that the energy, energy intensity of the GDP um, production is, is going down, which means increasing services, means increasing adding renewable energies, all kinds of things which have to add into this. So this is one of the major, one of the major issues. Thank you.
definitely need a mass transportation system, which is not just buses. That's something, and we look at China, which they did very well. At the time when these